All right, welcome class. The topic today is workplace training. I'd like to talk a little bit first about why training. Why, why bother investing in training? Because it is an investment. Uh, the reason is because many of the most admired companies do use training extensively. They recognize that training is a tool that can result in competitive advantage. So training can be something that increases organizational effectiveness and increases the efficiency of the workforce. It can be a good investment. On the other hand, billions of dollars are wasted either on ineffective training or training that's relatively effective but not supported once people return to the job. So in this uh, video, I'll give you some tools that will make you a smart manager regarding training, things that you can do to enhance the effectiveness of both the training and the, the uh, effectiveness of your organization, things that a lot of other managers won't know about, and uh, things that probably will impress your boss in terms of getting your money's worth out of training investments. So, the first of those topics I'd like to touch on is called training needs assessment. I'll say that again so you can catch it. Training needs assessment. Uh, there's a whole body of literature on that. There's a whole uh, body of practice on that. So the idea is before I invest in training, determine what the training needs are. And particularly if the organization is experiencing some difficulties, training needs assessment, uh, difficulties in terms of employee performance, training needs assessment might be a wise investment. So figuring out whether training is the issue, and if so, what content employees need. So that will help you target the training toward the need. So please keep that in mind. Training needs assessment is probably not something you would do for yourself as a manager. That's a good example of something where you would probably hire an experienced consultant who's done this before to conduct the training needs assessment for you. Another concept I would like to talk about is uh, transfer of training. And it's a big concept for this chapter because so much training results in so little payback. So I'd kind of like to get you guys in the mindset that I have, which is assume that it's amazingly difficult to get employees to utilize what they learn in training back on the job. Uh, another way of saying that is, uh, is kind of assume it's extremely difficult to change people's behavior by way of training. I think that's the proper mindset because that will help you design the training that will more likely achieve those outcomes. It's also kind of important, uh, related, I hinted at this with uh, transfer of training, that um, before investing in training, make sure that training is a solution. So a lot of times managers will jump to training as solution for a performance discrepancy. In other words, employees aren't behaving as one had hoped, and so we send them to training, or we have a training course. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't work. So an example would be maybe our employees are uh, supposed to be wearing various kinds of safety equipment, but they aren't. When management's not around, we tour the plant, we see that they're not utilizing the safety uh, gear that they should be wearing. So let's send them to training. They obviously need a refresher that uh, safety equipment is important. No, it might be that the uh, safety equipment is hot or uncomfortable to wear, so as soon as no one's watching, they take it off because it's uncomfortable. They may already be well aware that they should be wearing it. So in that case, training is not going to be the solution. So again, just be sure to be kind of a mindful manager and diagnose root causes of behavior before jumping toward a solution. It's uh, something that we need to do. We all tend to have pet solutions or preferred solutions and it's kind of a, some self-discipline that we need to exercise. Um, I would like to get you thinking about the three parties that are generally involved in training. This is another way to uh, maximize the effectiveness of training investments. So three parties, obviously you have the trainer, the person providing the training. You have the trainee, the person who is supposed to be learning the training. And then you have the supervisor. So if you could think of these three 
people as working together, uh, it will definitely improve the effectiveness of training. Uh, in other words, training is much more likely to be successful if all three of those parties are involved in different ways in the training process. And a way to do that is to take a look at the strategies for transfer. So along with this uh, learning module, I have posted a document called Strategies for Transfer. I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that document, look through it rather carefully, and write one of your entries on that. So, in other words, for your manual, you need to open the document, Strategies for Transfer, and look through it. This is something that will put you above and ahead of other managers when it comes to training because there are things you can do before training, during training, and after training that vastly improve the effectiveness and return on investment of training. So I would say look through those three lists before, during, and after and pick out things you think are smart and create a manual entry uh, on that. Here are some things that if I was a boss and I was sending employees to training or purchasing training on site, I would do. These would be things that I would do before, during, and after. That is um, kind of cutting edge knowledge that most managers aren't even aware are possibilities. So the issue is that if you do things before you send people to training, here's an example. Uh, one of the football coaches took this class and he said, he was an assistant coach, he said that uh, before he went to training on football offense, the head coach told him, when you get back from that training, you're going to teach me those new offenses. And this assistant coach that was sent to the training said that had a huge effect on the um, extent to which he paid attention during the training. So just the fact that he knew he was going to have to teach his boss what he was supposed to learn in that training when he got back really changed the attentiveness that he spent during the training. So uh, you could do something similar like that or say uh, when you get back from that training I'd like to discuss what you learn or when you get back from that training I'd like you to kind of share what was learned with our work group. Things like that um, can be helpful and again there's things the during part is things during the training that make it more effective. And after is also important. It's difficult to change people's work behaviors or habits. And so sometimes we send them to training to learn new behaviors, but they fall back into the old patterns of behavior once they get back on the job and they've got that inbox of things they need to respond to and uh, kind of a workload that's stacked up on them while they're gone. So the after follow-up to training is super important as well. Maybe I could touch a little bit on characteristics that distinguish companies with the most effective training practices. First one I'd like to mention is top management is committed to training and development. So what top management is committed to, what they pay attention to, has huge effects on organizational culture. And the same is true with training. So if uh, employees see that top managers consider training as important and even more uh, efficacious as if the top managers attend training and participate in training. That sends a strong signal. So as a manager, if you're wanting your employees to learn something or attend and benefit from some training, if you could learn that material first or participate with employees in the training, that sends a strong signal. It sends an even stronger signal if you could get the top manager at the site, so the president, the CEO, the general manager, to participate in the training. I have seen, uh, when I was a management trainer, I've seen a management training program thrive because our general manager was an active and highly visible participant in the training, including completing multiple modules of the training and taking exams over the training within uh, visibility of lower level supervisors. So you could see the effects that his participation in the training had on perceptions toward the training it thrived. That man general manager was promoted and the next general manager came in, a fellow with good intentions, but he 
He did not participate as actively in the training, and he didn't participate visibly at all. And that did affect um, how actively the rest of the managers on site pursued the training. So these things can have some very strong effects. DuPont, the chemical company, has been known to have some of the best training, uh, particularly safety training. And what they have traditionally done was have the top managers learn the safety training content first and then train their immediate direct reports, the people reporting to them. And then those high-level managers who've just been trained train the people directly reporting to them. So the training content cascades down through the organization. That sends an extremely strong uh, signal to employees about the importance of the training if these highly paid executives are taking time to do that. And personally, I know that if my boss, somebody who has a huge uh, effect on my future work life, on my raises, on my promotions, my performance appraisal, is training me on something, I'm going to pay good attention. So keep those things in mind as potential tools. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, making the most of the socialization period. So when you bring in new employees, that's a chance to kind of mold their attitudes and behaviors, and you want to make use of that entry period, that so-called socialization period. So you want to orient employees. You want probably want to enlist your best workers uh, as people to help help socialize the newcomer, right? It's important who is going to pass on the preferred behaviors and values to that newcomer. And you want to provide a lot of social support. Uh, starting a new job can be stressful and a bit unsettling. You're learning new things and making mistakes on occasion and uh, not feeling particularly confident. So a lot of social support, listening, checking in, uh, being friendly as a boss and a manager and as a co-worker as well is uh, really important. So please keep those things in mind and also keep in mind the, the value of orientation. So orientation is kind of like a formalized socialization for newcomers. It's, it's a training program. They are worthwhile. Research has proven that uh, a, an effective orientation can reduce newcomer stress and it also sends a pretty strong signal that this is an organization that has their act together. In other words, if I'm a newcomer and one of the first things I encounter is a well-designed orientation that's professionally de delivered, that makes me feel uh, more confident that I chose a good company to work for in addition to reducing my stress. So orientations are worthwhile. You want to pre-plan them. You want to conduct them intelligently. You want to make use of best practices. If you're designing an orientation program, uh, make use of the research literature, do a quick search. You don't need to read tons of scholarly articles, but there are do's and don'ts and best practices just like for anything else available. I would encourage you to uh, make use of those. One of those is to use the appropriate um, communication method for whatever you're trying to convey in the orientation. That may vary by content. Also, another best practice is not to overload people. Uh, in other words, we can only absorb so much at one time and newcomers to an organization are oftentimes getting hit with a lot of new information. So in some cases it may make sense to space out an orientation over a little bit longer period of time. Uh, an underutilized tool related to training I've mentioned is use of exams. So many of you are looking forward to the day when you don't have to take any more exams and that's perfectly understandable. However, I would like to encourage you to consider using exams in some cases related to uh, workplace training. So I worked in the nuclear industry for a while and it's obviously super important that people working with radioactive materials or extremely hazardous materials need to learn proper procedures and learn training content. Um, not kind of understand how to do things, but completely understand how to do things correctly and safely. So we did use exams a lot. For example, our new employee orientation was one week long. It was a 40-hour course. And to 
receive credit for that course, you had to complete an exam over the content with a score of 80% or higher. So it makes sense. Uh, if this is important material that you need to ensure employees are learning, some form of testing or exam may be an option for you, may be recommended. And um, a lot of times the use of exams will help employees understand that the content is important and have them pay a bit more attention to it. And it can also help you uh, understand the extent to which your training is effective. So that's kind of, we talked about training needs analysis on the front end and on the tail end uh, evaluating training. Was it effective or not? What could, could we do better next time? Is, it, is the training actually changing the behaviors on the job like we thought it would? Right? Is it having the results and payback that we thought it would? So training evaluation on the tail end of training or at some later date when it makes sense is a good way to find out uh, things you might need to do to adjust training or whether you even want to invest in that training in the future. Uh, lastly, I think I'll touch on new supervisors. Don't uh, most new supervisors or managers get trained through the kind of sink or swim method? They just, you're the boss now. They, they get promoted a lot of times it's, they're promoted because they're the most technically proficient employee or uh, the most senior employee. And um, that doesn't always translate into managerial skills. So I would strongly encourage you to, if you're a new supervisor, to ask for training or acquire it for yourself. And if you are hiring an organization and are promoting somebody to supervision or management, it would be very wise to invest in new supervisor training. So there's plenty of excellent books for new supervisors. I'm sure there's packaged programs by consultants and uh, even university professors, management professors could provide targeted training to help new managers. Or even uh, coaching. There's executive coaching. There could be coaching on external person like a management professor or some kind of consultant that could meet uh, periodically with the new manager in kind of a confidential and uh, exclusive relationship to help them solve problems and talk about issues that they're grappling with. So uh, not only coaching but just um, new manager training is, is hugely important. Um, we don't need our managers learning how to be effective through trial and error. In other words, we don't want them making mistakes that can be avoided. <clears throat> Everybody's going to make mistakes and it's tough being a new manager, but we don't have to learn everything through trial and error. There are many, many do's and don'ts that pop up for any manager. Uh, for, for example, disciplining employees. Never discipline employees in public. Always discipline in private. These are just management 101 things that we pass down uh, because they work and we want to pass those on to new managers so that they can avoid many mistakes that they really don't need to make. So I would conclude this video by just encouraging you to consider you've learned through Casio and through this video a number of things that can help you double or triple the effectiveness of training investments for your firm. Uh, tools that are pretty simple and pretty common sense but tools that most other managers aren't familiar with. So, you know, please utilize training effectively. Remember, it's a, a method of improving organizational performance. And just like anything else, there's best practices relating to training, develop, mentoring that you would want to implement in your organization. And that's kind of the value of your MBA. You're going to bring the more advanced knowledge and practices that most other managers have.